Questions? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Two. Okay. Now, uh, wait a minute. People are rushing in. Okay. Okay. Let Let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kelly from Dev Learning. We are designed for developers with basic skills to step into blockchain dev development, where they can get close to DeFi, NFT, DAO, crypto projects. We hope we could not only give junior developers an executable and simplest blockchain dev learning roadmap, but also present advanced developers with a platform for communication and cooperation. Today, we're so honored to have David from Request Network to give us a sharing about Request Network. Now, let's uh, now without further ado, let's welcome David to stream now. Hi, David. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for for the intro. Um, like like you said, I'm I'm David. Um, I also go by Mantis Clone online, if you ever see that. Um, and I'm a senior blockchain engineer at Request Network. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, just kind of an introduction of what Request Network is. Uh, I'm going to do um, a little bit of intro on um, the technologies that we're built on top of. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ecosystem that we're trying to build and, and the typical use cases that we think that uh, Request Network could be used for. Uh, and then from there, I'll dive a little bit more into some of the the way the architecture and, and the way that our protocol works under the hood. Um, and then I'll cap it all off with some information about our, our grants program, um, as well as our, our upcoming, well, we're, we're, we're planning to, to expand the team in, in the near future. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let me share my screen so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Let me know when you can see it. It should be a picture of just Request Network's logo. Yes, yep. it's clear. Oh, perfect, perfect. And then I'll just move this out of the way. Excuse me. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, Request Network. Uh, what is it, first of all? Uh, Request Network is a protocol for storing payment requests. Um, it solves the core problem that um, blockchain transactions, when, they, when they're sent from one person to the other, um, they're, they're missing context about why that payment occurred. Uh, we can see the, the person who sent the funds and we can see the, or rather not the person, but the, the address that sent the funds, the address that received and the amount and the currency, but we don't have any idea of like, was this a payment uh, that had a due date? Uh, are, are there deeper identities involved here? What were the line items that, that the, the, was actually being purchased or sold? What was this payment for? Um, and so that's that's what we store in Request Network. We we provide a, a stack of, of decentralized technologies to make that additional uh, context possible. Um, and so what would you want to build with, with a, a primitive like that? Uh, we, we imagine that there's a few different uh, use cases that, that this uh, concept would lend itself well to. And those include on the input side, the, the accounting apps, invoicing apps, or payment apps. Um, these are the types of apps that create invoices or create requests, that, that they're, they're interfaces for end users to go in and, and um, um, look at their own identity, look at all the requests associated with their own identity, but then also create new requests to other identities where they say, I, I want you to pay me uh, five USDC or, or 10 ETH or, or something like that. Um, and then on the, on the read side, on the output side, um, we have a variety of other apps that would probably want to consume that sort of data, the, the, the additional context that users are storing. This could be used for, um, <coughs> Excuse me. This could be used for for risk assessment in the creation of a credit score. Um, a, a protocol would probably want to be able to uh, read whether or not a user is paying all of their invoices on time before the due dates. That's something that would feed into a credit score. Um, 
This would also be inf interesting information for liquidity providers, somebody who's trying to do or, or uh, lenders, lenders, uh, uh, lenders, and liquidity providers, because they need a way to to underwrite their investments to 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 try and figure out if the if the payers in the interactions are likely to pay in the future, so that they can they can properly assess the risk associated with with um, lending. Uh, we might also see this for for insurance protocols or for fundraising protocols who would also want to get that sort of underwriting information. Uh, we also imagine that this sorts of, this sort of contextual data would be useful for automated compliance tools or automated auditing tools or or um, automated tax reporting tools or, or or even just personal finance management. Um, this the invoice information that is stored in, inside a request network could be used to power parts of these other apps. Of course, they they would pull in data from other sources as well, but um, we're just one piece of the puzzle. So as you can see, this our 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 stack, what it what it allows is uh, uh it creates like a standard uh, a standard data format for um other projects to store uh, uh payment information and then for other apps to read it. So so we, we believe that our system creates a, a kind of um uh more ownership for the end user. We, we, we believe that, that it allows them to take ownership of their financial data and, and grants them the choice to um, uh, use the platforms that work best for them. Uh, they, they, can, they can use one invoicing app in our ecosystem for some amount of time, and then maybe they decide that a different invoicing app has a better user interface or, or has better um, support or better it, it looks better or whatever, whatever, you know, floats their boat. Um, they could take all of their in data from the original invoicing uh, platform and port it into the new platform seamlessly using request network as a shared data storage medium. Um, so from there, uh, you're probably wondering what, what makes all of this, all of this work. Um, um, and the the short answer is that we're we're basically built on top of three primary technologies. We we use smart contracts for um, storing our uh, hashes of our data so that it that there's there's a permanent record that the data was stored. Um, we also store the actual request contents inside of IPFS. Excuse me. Um, we use uh, the graph uh, subgraphs for for indexing on chain events. And then we use uh, another set of smart contracts for for um, payments. The, it, it basically, it's it's just a thin wrapper around a typical transfer, with the exception that it it, it adds a, an event that can be indexed and, and tracked by our, our payment detection system. And so that's that's kind of what you can see on screen here. Um, there's there's a few primary uh, operations that Request Network supports. You can create a request. You can, uh, in the middle here, you can update a request. It's not shown on this diagram, but it is possible to update requests after they're created. Um, you can pay a request, and then uh, 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 and then finally, you can retrieve a request or detect a payment uh, um, after after the payments occurred. Um, and this this diagram in front of you kind of shows you the life cycle uh, by which that happens. Uh, when you're creating a request, you would create like a, a blob of, of JSON data. And, and the core pieces that would be in there include the payer identity, the payee identity, the currency that you're transacting in, uh, and the amount, the expected amount that should be paid. And so once you have that data kind of formatted, you would want to uh, use our SDK to, you, you would just call a single call, like create request. But what that does under the hood is that it writes your data into IPFS, and then it takes the content ID, the content addressable ID from IPFS, and it writes that on chain. Uh, uh, our storage smart contracts are deployed on a, a few different chains, but the primary one is, is Gnosis chain. That's that's kind of the canonical place for, for writing these hashes to show that a, a request is in fact valid. Um, we also have a couple of testnet deployments on Gorli and as well as Sepolia. Um, and then one of the things that um, is included in the IPFS data is something that we call a request ID. And that's a, a unique identifier for later looking up 
look looking at the, that that particular request. If you wanted to look it up by ID, you would use the request ID. <clears throat> but uh, along with the request ID, oh, I should mention that the request ID is is uh, it's it's derived from the contents of the request. So if any piece of data within the request changed, then the ID would be different as well. So uh, uh, another piece of data that's generated out of this is, is something that we call a payment reference. And a payment reference is very similar to a request ID um, in, in the fact that it uniquely identifies a request, but it's different in the way that we just we, we don't store it inside of IPFS. It's not something that you can look up the request by. Uh, instead, a payment reference is something that is used in the payment stage. Um, the payment reference is derived from the contents of the request, the same way the request ID is, but uh, it's a it's a one way hash, so you can't you can't go the other direction. And and what that does is when we when we pay the request, we use the payment reference as an input to the smart contract call, and inside the smart contract, when it em emits the event that allows us to detect the payment, it includes the payment reference in that event, and that's kind of what ties the payment to the request in IPFS. Uh, so I, 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 I kind of talked about it a little bit. We we have the ability to pay a request through one of our smart contracts. Um, and I'll just say at this, I'll, I'll explain it more later, but for now I'll say that we have a lot of different um, payment smart contracts available. There's there's a variety of different payment types that I'll get go into more in detail later. Um, but so so when, when the payment occurs, the, the event is emitted. And that event contains a few key items, including the, the the currency that is being transacted, the recipient of the of the payment, the amount that is being paid, and the payment reference uh, that gets indexed, so that we can um, we can index it inside of our subgraphs. Uh, we have a payment subgraph that that um, will track all of the different payments that occur against a particular payment reference, and um, by doing by by allowing multiple payments, we 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 basically allow a, a partial partial payments for a request. So when you're when when the payer is paying the request, they can they can optionally pay um, increments, smaller amounts instead of the full amount if they so choose. Um, so uh, the last thing that you would want to do is that you're able to retrieve a request as well as detect a payment. And what that involves is kind of you, uh, simultaneous queries to do diff two different parts. You 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 look into IPFS to get the request contents, and then you ask the graph to give you the current balance, the amount that has been paid towards that request so far. And then the, our SDK will will merge those two data pieces together and pass you back a JSON object that that has all of the information merged together. And that's kind of the whole life cycle. Uh, you can imagine th with the retrievals, you could build a, a dashboard page that shows all of the different invoices associated with a particular identity. Uh, for the payer request, you could have like a payment page with a button that says pay, pay now or like pay amount. And you can have like a, a field that lets you select the amount. And then the creator request, you, you could imagine that um, because there's many different payment types, uh, there's many different configurations when, when creating a request. And I'll, I'll dive into those a little bit more later. Excuse me. Um, how am I doing on time? I think I've got, I've spent 20 minutes so far. How long is this presentation again? Hey, sorry, David. I have a question. So. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, can you, can we get the, uh, our data from, uh, the graph? I think why need we put the data on IPFS? I think uh, you can get all the data from it, the graph. Do you think so? So, yes, yes. So, um, our we have a storage subgraph that indexes our 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 um, simultaneously. It it indexes our our hashes that go on chain as well as the data in our IPFS cluster or our IPFS network. So, um, it uh, yes. The short answer is yes. If if the request is unencrypted, if it's a non-private request you would have the ability to use the subgraph directly to uh, query the data. Um, that said, uh, our, our stored subgraph today is not, um, we're working on getting it publicly hosted somewhere, but for right now, we we don't have a public link to it. Uh, so in the meantime, you would have to use our SDK to um, access the contents of a request. 
but but that is something that we're working on fixing in the future. Oh, okay, I see. Does that answer your question? Yes, I see. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Oh, excuse me. Um. Okay, so uh, it, uh, uh, the next th topic that I want to talk about is is kind of the the idea of a request node and the our request network SDK and how those two kind of operate together. Um, the request network SDK is a is a compilation of a variety of different packages that are 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 purpose built for different different the use uh, uses in our protocol. Um, but the, but it's it, the primary two that you would want to focus on are, are the request client and the payment processor. Basically, the request client has high level functions for creating requests as, as well as retrieving requests. And then the payment processor has the, the lower level functions for paying a request, some of which are integrated into the request client, but others of the more advanced ones, you have to go to the payment proce processor directly. Um, and it is possible to create a request, interact directly with the smart contracts, interact directly with IPFS, all through the SDK from the front end, from, from a, a client side. Um, that is possible. However, what we've seen from our builders is that uh, to ease the user experience, many of them would prefer to take care of some of the, some of the signatures and operations on the back end. Um, and so what we did was we created a, something called a request node. Uh, the request node takes care of persisting requests uh, and retrieving requests for you. And it also provides a, a way to, uh, for, for, the, for the platforms, for the builders in our ecosystem to subsidize the costs of creating a request on behalf of the end user. And so that's, that's kind of two of the, 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 the main reason why the request node exists is to kind of offload some of the persistence as well as uh, offload the costs of, of persisting, the protocol fees. But so basically you would use the request client to create and retrieve requests. You would send messages to the request node. Uh, the request node will then talk with the request network IPFS network. Um, and it will persist requests and retrieve CIDs. Um, then the our storage subgraph is going to be able to index new documents inside of our request IPFS network, as well as index events from our storage smart contracts on Gnosis chain. And it returns all of those pieces of data back to the request node. Um, the request node also allows you to um, query data from our payment subgraph. And we, we have a separate payment subgraph for, for each chain. Um, and it serves as kind of a, a an indexing layer on top of the, the the payment smart contracts that that we use to execute the payments. Um, I think I, I think the only thing I want to mention here is that the there's the uh, you probably guessed that that I, I mentioned that there is a protocol fee and and uh, on that topic I'll mention that we have a a rec token our REQ rec token um, and the role that that plays in our ecosystem is that. Uh, it costs a small amount of rec every time a request gets created. And technically, uh, our, our since our storage is on Gnosis chain, uh, we actually collect the, the protocol fee in, in XDAI, um, and then the XDAI gets bridged to mainnet, swapped for rec, and then the rec gets burned. Mm. And, and so you can guess the based on that tokenomic scheme, uh, the rec token, its primary value proposition is that it it prevents spam and it it is a deflationary token. So the the total supply is capped. And every time a request gets created, the total supply decreases and that drives value to the other tokens. Um, you probably heard me say earlier that um, if, if you want to read data out of our storage subgraph, um, it would have to be unencrypted data, uh, public public requests. Um, we imagine that that is probably the easier option for builders to implement, but not necessarily the, the end goal. We assume that most of our builders are probably going to want to implement private requests at some point because the typical end user doesn't want all of their invoices to be um, entirely public. Uh, you'd rather have the, the line items and the identities of the individuals involved to be uh, private. 
So what our, our protocol supports is, is the ability to encrypt and decrypt the contents of a request before it gets written into IPFS. Um, and the way that we do that is actually very similar to HTTPS. If, if you're familiar with the HTTPS protocol, um, basically we have like a channel key that, that encrypts the contents of the data. This is an, a, a symmetric key, meaning that it's the same key for encrypting and decrypting. Um, and the reason we use a symmetric key for that is because the, the encryption operations are, are relatively cheap to execute in terms of processing power, whereas uh, uh, asymmetric encryption is much more costly. Um, but so once we have the encrypted channel data, we then take a copy of the channel key and encrypt it with each of the stakeholders' public keys. And so uh, we, we write that encrypted channel key alongside the encrypted data. Uh, by doing that, that means that anytime uh, a stakeholder of that request later retrieves the encrypted data, they can use their private key to decrypt the, the channel key, and then they can use the channel key to decrypt the contents of the request. And so uh, the, this, the image on screen right now is showing the encryption side. And um, here is another image that shows the decryption side. We can see that uh, step number one, the user uses uh, that they they retrieve the encrypted AES key. They use their private key to decrypt it. They get the AES key, and then the AES key is used to decrypt the contents of the request. And we can see the co request contents returned to the user here. Okay, um, that was actually the that was that was all of the um, the lower level. Um, uh, description of how the protocol works. Um, what I'm going to do next is um, what do I want to do? I want to talk about I want to talk about some of the um, the different payment types that we support. I, I I had mentioned it earlier in the presentation, and um, I actually don't have a slide for it. But uh, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to show you our docs real quick. Can you everybody see this well enough? How do you guys feel about dark mode? I could switch to light mode if you prefer. <laughs> uh, I think it's good. It's good. Okay. Um, okay, I'll go back to dark mode because that's that's fine. Okay, so um, right now, what I'm I'm on our supported chains page inside of our docs, and the reason I want to show you this is it's because it it shows a lot of the different payment types that we support. So um, you can imagine when you're making a payment, there's a, a few different variables that, that can come into play. You might be doing a native token payment. So on, on Ethereum, that would be ETH, or on Polygon, that would be uh, Matic. Um, or you might be doing an ERC-20 transfer. That's Those are any of the other tokens that are built on top of uh, the native chain. Um, those are kind of the two very, very basic types. Um, but there's uh, there's other types that we've come up with. Um, one of them is, is what we call uh, like a, you can't see it very well here, but it's a conversion payment. I can't get it to wrap any better, but um, a, a conversion payment is something that we, um, uh, uh, we basically denominate the request in one currency, but the payment is actually settled in a different currency. And so what the, the common use case for this is that um, invoices are typically denominated in some sort of fiat value because that's what accounting systems typically rely on. Uh, so I could create a request for USD, but then the actual payment could be executed in USDC. And uh, the way that we implement this is with a, a on-chain um, price feed Oracle data feed. <clears throat> By using that data feed, at the moment of payment, we can do a price conversion and ensure that the end user, the, the, the payee, receives exactly the amount in USD, or the, they, they would receive a, an amount of USDC that equals the value of the USD that they requested. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, that's, that's one of our most common um, payment types because, like I said, it, it plugs in well with the existing uh, accounting world. On top of that, we also have the ability to do batch batch uh, conversion payments. So, and and this this particular type uh, this includes um, other the, the basic ERC twenty and uh, uh, um, 
native payment types as well. So you can batch a variety of different payments all together in one single transaction. That's super useful for pay, uh, payers who are going into their invoicing platform and instead of paying each invoice with a separate transaction, they can just initiate a single transaction to pay all of them at once. Um, we also have a few uh, more interesting payment types. We, we have uh, swap to pay. Um, this one is uh, uh, this one allows you to execute a swap immediately before sending the final token to the to, to the payee. Um, uh, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next one. We also have a swap to conversion that kind of campaign uh, uh, combines the previous two. You would execute a swap to a cryptocurrency but then the invoice is still denominated in USD. So uh, the that would be, if, for instance, if, if somebody wants to pay DAI, but the recipient wants to receive USDC, but then they, the invoice is denominated in USD. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the swap to conversion is what would support that. Uh, here's another interesting one. We, we support something called transferable receivables. Um, and uh, that's a fancy way of saying like a, an invoice NFT. Basically, what we do is we take our, our request contents, uh, uh, rather, we, we, we create the request in IPFS, but then we create a, a reference to it as an NFT on chain. And this NFT is, uh, it, it has a, a, a contract call on it called um, pay owner. Um, so basically, whoever holds the NFT is the is the uh, address that will eventually receive the payment, and what that allows the the payee to do is they they could they could create this request, um, and and it it becomes a representation of their future income, but then they can use that as collateral to lend against so that they can have income today instead of waiting thirty or sixty or ninety days for their invoice to be paid. Um, in certain parts of the world, they call this operation in uh, invoice factoring or invoice financing. Um, something along those lines. Um, so uh, uh, we, we think that's a really cool use case and that's why we believe that uh, lenders uh, can be a, a, a major part of our ecosystem as well. Uh, we also have an escrow. So if, uh, uh, if you're familiar with escrows, it's like uh, it flips the payment paradigm on its head. Instead of, the, instead of the payee requesting funds and then the payer sending it directly, the payer posts funds into an escrow to show that they are ready and willing to pay. And then the payee, you know, does whatever work or provides whatever service. And, and then uh, the, the escrow pays the, the payee when, when the work is completed. Um, so we, we have an escrow contract that, that we support on several different chains. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll skip the rest of these. The, the rest of these are kind of our more pr primitive contracts, but those, the, the, the ones that I've described are kind of our major uh, payment types. Um, there's one that I skipped. Uh, one more. Uh, we we also support uh, superfluid streaming. So if you wanted to create a request for a superfluid stream, uh, and then the payee would receive a constant stream of of uh, of um, of tokens every uh, every block, then that that is something that we support as well. Uh, but the the reason it's not listed on this page is because we we just use the superfluid smart contracts as is without much modification. Okay. Uh, Jumping back to my my presentation, uh, I I I already uh, I have a slide up on on screen right now that's basically just a link to our docs. Uh, you can see it here, and I'll, I'll I can I can send out these um these slides after after the presentation if you guys like. Um, you can find all sorts of great great stuff in our docs. Uh, uh, basically, a, a lot of the stuff I talked about today is in our get get started section, but we have um, more in depth uh, references to our our, our SDK. We also have several guides about how to do various things in our protocol, um, and we we uh, even have a, a, an FAQ page. That's that's what I want to talk about next. So there's there's a bunch of things about our protocol that people typically get tripped up on. So if there's anything that you're that you're confused about, our FAQ page is an excellent resource to try and learn uh, uh, what what the mistake or what the um, what the confusion might be. Um, I encourage you guys to check it out, and. Um, my next slide. <laughs> um, oh, here. Uh, there's one more thing that I wanted to do before I, I move on to the end of my presentation. Uh, we have a we have a quick start. 
and um, the quick start um, shows you the basics of how to how to set up uh, create a request, pay a request, and then retrieve that request from Request Network. Um, and all of it's kind of uh, I can I can dive into this. You guys you guys are a re relatively technical crowd, right? So I'll I'll, I'll dive into this. Um, basically, when you when you're creating a request. Um, you would want to start by uh, instantiating an Ethers v5 provider. Um, uh, we also technically support Wagme or VM on the creation side, but when it comes to payments uh, for the payment side, we we have to have to use the Ethers v5 for now. We're working on on getting up to date with uh, some of the other more popular libraries. Um, uh, so basically, you would you would create your provider and you would inject that into what we call a Web3 signature provider. And this is this is a, a an object that's basically um, going to allow the request network SDK to pop up the little you know MetaMask uh, pop up or whatever other uh, uh, pop up that 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 you're configured with. Um, uh, we're compatible with like uh, if if you use Wagme on this stage, you could uh, you could uh, use a variety of other different wallet providers as well. Um, but that's that's what allows you to sign the contents of the request before you create it. That's that's what attributes it to the the person who creates the request. So once you have your Web three signature provider, you would inject that into a request network object, and uh, like I described before, the typical use case is to connect that to a request node gateway. Um, and we have a we have a page here in our docs that has the links to both of those. We've got one on Gorley right now and one on um, Gnosis Chain. Um, and so once you have your request network object, <clears throat> you would craft the, the creation parameters. Um, I kind of laid this out in my lifecycle diagram earlier. You would, you would set up the currency, you would set up the expected amount in machine readable units. You would have the payee identity, the payer identity optionally that you, you, you don't necessarily need that. Um, and you would have the timestamp in there as well. And then some of the, uh, some of the other pieces are the, the payment network. This, this parameter is what defines the way that the payment is going to be executed. In this case, you can see it's using the ERC-20 fee proxy, which is basically uh, a simple ERC-20 transaction that takes uh, an optional fee on the top and, and sends it to a, a, some address. Um, uh, we can see here that the payment address, this is the address that will actually receive the payment. And it's important to note here that the payment address is not necessarily the same as the payee identity address. They are both Ethereum addresses, um, and they can be the same. But um, we 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 differentiate them so that you can have a single identity to which all of your requests are associated. That's that's your identity. But then you could potentially have multiple addresses that you receive payments on. So that's that's the the reason for the differentiation there. Um, we also have a, a field in here for content data, and that's that's an arbitrary data piece that that you could put any any piece of JSON data into. Um, this is where you would put the stuff like, you know, uh, 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 information about the payee or the payer, like their address or their tax number, or, or you could also put in um, line items if you're, if you're building an invoice. Or if you're doing um, uh, something that has a has a due date, we would recommend putting a due date in there. <clears throat> All of that stuff would go into content data. Uh, we actually have a, a standardized invoice data format that we rec recommend that people use because it's uh, it's used by Request Finance, one of our largest builders, and it's uh, it's it's really got pretty much everything that you would want in, in an invoice. Um, and then finally, we have the signer. The signer is the one that is that is attesting that this invoice contents is correct. And it's going to be either the payee or the payer. And so finally, that there's a simple um, function in there uh, in our SDK called create request. You're just going to take these parameters and pass it into it. And it's going to pass you back a request object. Um, and this request object is not necessarily finalized when, it, when you first receive it. There's another uh, function you'd have to call uh, wait for confirmation. Uh, and, and this is what's going to wait for your, your IPFS data to be written. It's going to wait until the the CID is written on chain, and it's going to wait until the um, the on chain event is indexed by our storage subgraph. And once those three three things are um, finished, you'll receive a a response from this from this method. 
And so uh, I've got I've got some code sandboxes for for doing this. It, it looks like my, my my create one might not be working right now, but I'm hoping that my pay request one is. Um, we'll keep on scrolling down here. The 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 payment side is very similar. Uh, we're going to create a, a connection to the request node gateway. Um, we're going to retrieve a request by ID. Uh, we're going to get the contents of that data. That's what this get data thing is, and that's just a it's it's not actually making a, a call. It's it's just unwrapping a piece of data uh, uh, locally on the client side. Um, but then once you do that, you 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 get your Ethers v five provider again. Um, you would check that the user has sufficient funds before they they try to attempt the payment. Uh, then if it's in the case of an ERC twenty, you can um, you can check for ERC twenty approval. And and these two functions right here has sufficient funds and has ERC twenty approval. Those are just convenience functions that our SDK supports. Um, obviously, there's many different ways that your projects could build this. Uh, functionality. You don't have to use our SDK for this, but you know it makes it easier. Um, and then finally, we have this pay request function. And this, this high-level function basically just takes in the request data, figures out the appropriate payment type, and then sends the um, transaction to the appropriate um, smart contract to execute the payment. And so this, this, this high-level function makes it really easy to execute whatever payment the, the user is, is desiring. If it's a batch payment or if it's a um, uh, a conversion payment or a, a ERC-20 payment, it'll it'll just figure it out. And so finally, you can, um, uh, what we have is this request.refresh function. Um, when you're waiting to see if a request has been paid, you would basically just pull that function. And when <laughs> when you see that it is uh, um, uh, the, the balance it, uh, exceeds the expected amount, then uh, that is your indication that the request has been paid. Uh, uh, you can tell that this is a very flexible sort of way of doing this. The balance could be less than, but uh, less than the expected amount, but greater than zero in the case of a partial payment. Or it could technically even be above. Like you could, you, our, our smart contracts are, are flexible, so you know they, 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 it is possible to overpay a request. Um, okay, luckily it looks like my my create and pay a code sandbox is working. So I'll, I'll cap off my my presentation here with a quick demo of what this could look like. Let's see if this this will load up. Excuse me. Uh, you can see the. Um, the code over here on the left, the, the primary file is the, the page, page.tsx. And we can see that it's got, it's, it's, it's a long file. It's got, it's got a lot of the code I just described um, in, in more detail. But what I really wanted to show was the, um, the actual uh, execution of the demo. So we can see I've got a simple form here. Um, I've got the field for, for creating a request. And then down here, I've got stuff for paying a request. And then all the way at the bottom, I've got stuff about the uh, the request state. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to connect my wallet, and I'm going to use MetaMask for this demo. OK, so it's going to automatically reconnect me somewhere. Um, so I've got my, my address connected. For this demo, I'm going to create um, I'm going to create a real request. So I'm actually going to use the Gnosis gateway to create this request. Actually, you know, scratch that. I'm going to use the I'm going to use the test gateway for today. I'm going to create a test request, um, and uh, the the only required fields are the the amount. So I have to specify that I'm going to send uh, two, and the currency that I'm going to send is something called an FAU, uh, a faucet token. This is just a fake token on on Gorly that you can get for free. Um, and then for this demo, I'm going to leave the payment recipient as my own address. Uh, you can see it's here, it's the 70. Um, so when the payment occurs, it's actually just going to loop back through the smart contract back to my own address. Um, the payer identity, I'm going to leave blank for this one because um, it's only optional. Um, the due date is also optional, but I'll, I'll go ahead and set a value of tomorrow. And the reason I'm just going to put in uh, beta. So I'm going to submit that. 
And the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to prompt me for a signature. Um, I have a few plugins uh, for, for protecting me from stuff. So you know, I'll, I'll just click through those really quickly. But after they're gone, uh, a pop-up for MetaMask should appear. And what we're going to see here is the, we can see the contents of the request. Basically, we have the currency, we've got the value, or sorry, the, the, the expected amount. We've got the, um, the extension data, which includes both the content data and the payment extension, the, the, pay, the payment network. And we can see that I'm using the payment network ERC20 fee proxy contract. Uh, you can see that the fee address was set to zero with a zero fee amount and that the payment recipient is going to be my own address. We can see that the payment's going to occur on Gorly, um, that this is the creation of the request. Uh, we can even see stuff like the builder ID. I'm creating this using request network created with code sandbox. Uh, the due date is in there and the reason is pizza. And then the payee identity that I'm paying it to is my own address right here and the timestamp. So all this looks good. I'm going to go ahead and sign it. Hmm. And uh, once I signed it, uh, the this request info at the bottom got populated. We can see that it's pending right now. It is in the process of persisting the um, the transaction on chain. Uh, I didn't scroll fast enough. Uh, what it did before this was it was actually persisting in IPFS for a brief moment, but that operation tends to be pretty quick. Uh, so I'm going to wait until the request state turns to created. I think that's what I'm waiting for here. Oh, uh, sorry. Request confirmed. That's that's that that is the indication that the request has been confirmed, but the request state is still pending because I haven't paid it yet. That's that's what it is. Okay, so I can scroll back up here uh, in the payment section. I can see that I'm connected to Ethereum right now. Uh, so I have a button here for quickly switching over to the Gorly chain because that's where the payment should occur. And of course, my MetaMask is still super zoomed in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna unzoom that out real quick. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch networks, and now we can see that I am on. Uh, we can see that I'm connected to Gorley. Um, so from there, I I can see that I need to issue an approval. Um, or sorry, no, I, I I check if I need approval. So it, it's checking if the payer has sufficient funds. Uh, it's it says that I have sufficient funds. Uh, it's checking if the request. Uh, is approved. Uh, I have sufficient approval, so I don't need to do an approval transaction today. Um, and so then the uh, the pay now button appears. I can click that, and we can see that the status changes to paying. Uh, I can go to. Uh, I'm going to just try and goose this, make it make it go faster. We can see that I'm I am calling a function transfer from with reference and fee. That's one of the functions on our payment smart contract. So I'll confirm this. And we can see that the status is paying and we're gonna wait. Uh, um, oh, I wish this was bigger. Uh, the part that I really wanna focus in on is the, the state as well as the balance. Okay, right here. So when the balance increases to the amount that was expected and when the state changes from pending to, um, sorry, no, the, the state isn't gonna change. It's just the balance that's gonna change. But when the balance changes, that's when my indication that the, the request has gone through. Okay, so the balance, we can see that the payment was detected. Uh, my, my JSON here reloaded. And if I go to the balance, we can see that the balance is two, two, two tokens as, as expected. Okay, so that is that is my demo. You can tell that I, I, I did all three operations I created, I paid and I retrieved. Um, uh, and uh, just to, since I'm at 50 minutes now, let's just go ahead and wrap that up. Um, we have a grants program. So if any of you guys are interested in building any of these sorts of apps, accounting apps, invoicing apps, payment apps, or automated compliance, automated auditing, lending, or, or risk assessment, any of those, feel free to apply to our grants program. Um, you can find it at this URL on screen. Um, and I'll also briefly mention that we 
are planning to hire another uh, developer uh, uh, sometime soon. So, uh, but we haven't we haven't posted the job job rep requisition yet. So when when that happens, take a look at our careers page. Uh, is right here. It's just a. Uh, Keep an eye on this, um, and when it when it pops up, feel free to uh, apply. So that is uh, that is it. Thank you all very much. Um, I'll uh, I'll open it up for questions there if if anybody has any. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. We have we indeed have some questions, as you can see in the chat box. Oh, I haven't first. been watching. I'm sorry. <laughs> The first is, what are the advantages of request network compared to traditional payment systems? Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so what are the advantages of request network compared to traditional payment systems? Um, yeah. I think the, the main advantage that I would mention is that um, the 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 requests and the invoices um, are stored in, in, in a, a decentralized way where the, the user owns that data. So I think that the, like I mentioned at the top of the presentation, the primary value add that we provide is, is that we provide additional context to basic transactions. Um, I'll add on to that, that um, over time we've developed a few sort of uh, uh, more complex payment types. Um, and so uh, I would say that we're we're ahead of the curve as far as supporting uh, the payment types that a, a payment processor would need to would need to support. Um, I, I, I don't know of any other payment um, platforms that that support this the same variety of of payments that Request Network does. Cool, cool, cool. And the second question is: How's the security of payment requests ensured on the Request Network? Sure. Okay. So, so the security of a payment request, um, uh, the, there's there's a few different layers there. There's the um, the integrity of it, the the fact that it, it 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 hasn't been tampered with, and the way that we ensure that is using signatures. Basically, the the signature applies to the entire request contents, and it's applied at the moment of creation on the client side by the user, the end user, um, and so that request then gets stored into IPFS. Um, and it's impossible to change the contents of it after that point without also changing a few things. It would change the request ID, it would change the CID in IPFS, uh, and it would invalidate the signature. So I, I think that's the, all of those things is what um, leads to the security of it. Um, I'll also say that by by storing it in IPFS, um, we 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 have the ability to have multiple different nodes. Um, storing complete copies of of the request uh, history, and and so that creates uh, redundancy in the data. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll mention that the uh, security can also be talked about in terms of like privacy, the privacy of the data, and and we offer, like I mentioned, the the encryption mechanism for for encrypting that data and ensuring that only the stakeholders who have the right to to view it and ownership over it can can actually see it. Does that okay. answer the security question? Yes, I think so. Perfect. And here are another two questions. One is from Paco, and our uh, he is our core member, and he asked, "Are there any DeFi projects integrated with requests?" Um. Yes. Yeah. So we 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 do have some projects integrated with Request Network. The most prominent one that you might have heard of is Request Finance. Uh, uh, is a it's a project that was actually built by the same core team that originated Request Network, but then they decided to spin off and create a, their own platform for for issuing crypto invoices. And uh, they're they're celebrating a very exciting milestone just just at the end of this year of of having processed over five hundred million dollars worth of. Uh, of uh, of crypto payments, so the, a very exciting milestone for them. Um, the that we have other grantees within our ecosystem that are currently working on building. Um, some of the ones that uh, uh, I could mention off the top are uh, uh, Bezos. Bezos is building an uh, uh, like a invoice factoring platform. Um, we also have Huma and Copra 
uh, Huma Finance is, uh, I could type it in the chat here. Finance uh, is us. Um, all three of those are building sort of lending products. Um, we also have, um, sorry, we, we, we have a lot of ongoing grant applications. Oh. So I, I want to be careful not to mention ones that are not finalized. Um, but uh, we we have uh, we have other grantees. We also have a uh, job job marketplaces. Um, there, there's a there's one called Joba, Joba Network is building like a, a freelancing platform, and they're using Request Network uh, for invoicing. Um, cool. Forgive me. I, there's others, but I, I'm I, I, at the risk of of mentioning something I shouldn't. I, I'll, I'll leave that there. But we have we have. Uh, uh, over over ten different grantees in our pipeline right now, so uh, lots of exciting stuff going on at, at Request Network. Yes, that sounds really exciting. And the last question is: Will Request Network take uh, account abstraction into consideration in the future development? Account abstraction. I think the short answer is yes. I, I, I the the honest answer is I'm still trying to wrap my head around account abstraction and its its um, implications for our our network. Um, based on my understanding, is that they they the basic primitive of an account abstraction wallet is a smart contract, right? And and so we we would need to be able to um, accept signatures from a smart contract as opposed to signatures from an EOA. Um, and uh, the short answer is yes, that we are we are thinking about that. Um, today, as far as I know, you can't create, you can, you can pay a request using a multi-sig um, or any other account abstraction wallet, but I, I'm not 100% convinced that it's possible to create a request using a multi-sig or an account abstraction wallet so we're we, basically we, we have to we have to figure out how to handle the signatures in in that case um it definitely definitely part of our consideration possibly not supported today um we're, we're still looking into it oh cool i think that's the end of the question okay. i do see i do see a couple more that i i'd be open to okay. answering um okay. one of them was uh the payment network name gorley why not use chain id here uh, so the answer to that is um, because we actually support non EVM chains as well. Um, we have a few payment smart contracts that are deployed on Near, and and if you're familiar, Near does not have a chain ID the same way that EVM compatible chains do, um, and so that's that has evolved as as a a valid reason to keep our our payment network names. Admittedly, back when we first developed this. Maybe chain ID would have been a better choice, <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, for now, since we're we're now targeting non EVM chains, it seems like a valid choice as well. Um, and then there was another question: Are there any institutions aspect in the invoice? Um, yes, yeah. So I, I mentioned that content data field. Um, it, it is possible to put any amount of information about the payee identity and the payer identity in there if you so choose. It could it could be like the the business address or the business phone number, or it could be the tax identification number for for a business. Um, you could put any of any of that sort of stuff in the content uh, data field. Does that answer the question? I think so. Okay, I think there. Well, let me see. Okay, I think there is no more questions. Yes. Now, okay, let's wrap up the meeting. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. We have a lot of content here and we hope that we can have more connections in the future. Okay, have a good day. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.